Hello everyone and welcome back to Inside Art Scroll, where the books you read and the people who write them come to life. Today I am privileged to be joined by Rabbi Daniel Gladstein. Thank you, Rabbi Daniel, for joining us. Rabbi Yitzchak, to see you. We're here to discuss primarily your Haggadah, Rabbi Daniel Gladstein on the Haggadah, which came out last year, was one of the best-selling Haggadahs of the year. I can tell you the feedback that I got on this Haggadah was, was phenomenal. Thank you. Uh, people <clears throat> appreciate your style. They appreciate the questions you ask, the answers you give, the way you, you build up a sugyo almost, uh, you know, on... On the, on the issues that interest people as relates to the, uh, to the Haggadah. Uh, talk for a moment about why you were uh, propelled to write a Haggadah. What, what was the mindset when you wrote it? Tell you, look, uh, there is certainly no shortage of Haggadahs out there, or certainly no shortage of uh, art school Haggadahs. Right. But what's amazing in Torah is that the, the more you look at something, the more you see Still, makom hiniach lano. There's, there's always a, a niche. There's always a, a place. And studying, I wanted to, to study the Haggadah, not just to say, oh, a, a vertel here, a vertel there. A vertel. There's always a dvartar you could say on each shtikel. But to look at the Haggadah as one living document to try to understand what's, what's the introduction of the Haggadah, what's the main body of the Haggadah, what's the close of the Haggadah, What's the flow? Why do certain Tanaim appear in the beginning and they sort of, you don't hear from them again, and other Tanaim, they come toward the end of the Seder, as if each Tana has a specific role in the Seder and a specific juncture. Is there significance to the number of words or the number of paragraphs? To look at the Haggadah as one uh, entity and also as a living entity. What I mean by that is why certain concepts are mentioned where they are. Mm -hmm. And looking at the Haggadah in this, in this vein, it opened up like a very uh, vast uh, vistas of understanding for me, and uh, I, I was inspired to share it. It's interesting that you mentioned that, that you approached it like that, because I was going to ask, what, when you decide, okay, I want to write a commentary on the Haggadah, okay, where do you start? I mean, there are, you mentioned the art scroll Haggadahs, there are, Dozens of art scroll Haggadahs from the classics, you know, printed decades ago to more recent ones, and each one brings its own flavor from a different Gadol or from a collection of Gadolim and things of that sort. When you s sat down, so to speak, proverbially, to write a Haggadah, uh, do you just start uh, at Kaddish and say, okay, what can I find out about that? You know, people often ask, you know, what's the process? Right. And I, I feel that I wish I could pinpoint what the process is. The only analogy I have is, you know, Torah is, of course, um, it's a chachma, but I think that in terms of writing, it's an art. In other words, if, if you were to ask a painter, you know, how did you start with this painting? Which, which dot did you paint first? I don't know if a person would be able to identify it, so, so to speak, like, you have an inspiration, and then... You just go with it. It flows, yeah. Um, if I give you an example of, of what I mean, you know, the Haggadah basically... Well, I'll give you a few examples, okay? Um, the bookends of the Haggadah. The Haggadah begins, let's say, Halach Manya, Hashata Hacha, Lashan Haba, Ba'ar Di Yisrael. That's basically, in Aramaic, Lashan Haba Birushalayim. It ends with Lashan Haba Birushalayim. So, you know, to me, that, that's certainly of note. It can't be a coincidence that mm -hmm. it begins and ends the same way. You know, the Gemara in Saita says that if you want to, and there's a rule in life, anybody knows, if they want to get a good idea what a book is about, you know, you take the book, you open up to the beginning, you open up to the end, mm -hmm. and that gives you an idea what the book is about. The, the, you know, the Gemara applies this to the Torah itself. The Gemara says, the Torah is kula gemilas chasadim. You know, it begins that Hashem clothed the Adam Arisha, and it ends that Hashem buries Moshe Rabbeinu. It begins with Chesed, it ends with Chesed. So the whole uh, Torah is Kulay Chesed. So that, that would have to mean, if the Haggadah begins, you know, L'shan Haba Yerushalayim, and it ends that way, that must be what the Haggadah is about. That must be thematic to the entire mm -hmm. body material. And I'm wondering, but it's not at all. L'shan Haba Yerushalayim has nothing to do with Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. This is a story... We went down to, to Mitzrayim, they enslaved us, and Hashem freed us. But it's not about, you know, 
aspirations for Geula, but it must be that if these are the bookends, Chazal, and by the way, another, when I say Chazal, you know, it's amazing. There's so many Haggadahs. Who wrote the Haggadah? Who wrote it? I, I literally looked in dozens we, and dozens of Haggadahs. We don't know. So I, I, I really looked into this topic extensively, and this uh, edition begins with a major essay, 10 approaches right. to who wrote right. the Haggadah. So th- right. that's an example of, there's so much information about the Haggadah, but there, you'll always find pockets of, you know, uh, and, and opinions that range from Anshin Knesset Gdoyla, Moshe Rabbeinu, mm-hmm. Rabbi Chaim Falaji says it was Rabbi Akiva, the Mabum Haggadah says it was Rabbi Yudah Anasi. Right. So it could be, and Rav Miller says, the Jewish people wrote the Haggadah. It's a compilation. Over the years, over the years, right. Yeah. Which would explain certain uh, language discrepancies and things like that. But yeah. I, I, if I could say that I think that that's what makes, the, from my vantage point as a reader, uh, what makes this Haggadah so unique, maybe different than others, is that almost every topic that you address, when the reader reads it, they think, hey, you know, how come, I, how come I never asked that question? Like, who wrote the Haggadah? And then you have that lengthy essay. Or uh, you discuss, for example, how do we say halal at night? That's a very basic question. Halal said by Yoyim, not by Laila. And you have a beautiful essay on that. But these are questions that people have that maybe they should have. They don't realize till they see it in your Haggadah. Hold on, this is a question I should have had. And then you address it so beautifully and you lay it out step by step by step, you increment and you build, almost build the reader's curiosity. That's your style in all your svarim. Thank you. You do the same in, in your beautiful sefer that you put out not long ago on, on Rebbe Baalanes and, uh, and your other svarim on the Mayadim and so on and so forth. You have, Baruch Hashem, this unique uh, style that Thank people you. connect to and, and it manifests itself very prominently in, the, in this Haggadah besides for the the, the depth, the, the clarity, your yidiyas, uh, just the, it's a breath of fresh air. So um, whoever, the, the people who didn't get to taste the beauty of Rabbi Gladstein on the Agada last year, Shem, they should be able to do it uh, this year at the Seder. But uh, as a segue, I'm curious, growing up, Pesach, the Seder, what was it like in the Gladstein house? And <laughs> who, who had the ashpa on you to create the flavor of of uh, Zman Chiruseinu. Well, you know, uh, the Seder night is the, the go-to memory in uh, everybody's mind. And whenever somebody thinks about the Haggadah, they always think back to how their Seder was uh, growing up. One of the uh, very powerful things I bring in the very beginning was uh, my grandfather, who I've spoken about many times sure. in this platform, Harav Mordechai Leib Gladstein, who was a survivor of the Holocaust, he passed away a few years ago, the night of the Seder. Is that right? Wow. Yeah, well, the first day of Pesach in the morning. Hmm. So uh, my father asked my grandfather, this was in the morning of uh, Tesva of Nisan, he said, you know, Tati, are you okay? Because he wasn't so responsive. And he said, I'm waiting for the Geula. And he had Misas Nashika. Wow. So, and my grandfather, if you remember from the Purim book, my grandfather was named Mordechai because his bris was on Tainus Esther, right. but he passed away on Pesach. on Pesach. So we say, you know, Mismach Geula Le Geula. Right. You know, his whole life, and this is a theme of the Sefer, his whole life, it was awaiting the Geula. He believed when he was in Auschwitz, he believed Be'amun Shlema every single day Mashiach would come. And Mamish, his his dying words, his last words were, he's awaiting the Geula. So when I say that the book ends are Lashon HaBab Yerushalayim, this reflects that, you know, it's very important to tell our children. They're, they're going to say, we're reading the story, we read it last year, we read it the year before, what well, we're reading a story that happened 3,300 years ago. So I bring Rabbeinu Bechaye in at least six Mekoymois, in the Karakemach, al he says, all the Nevi'im are misnave in the same signoin, in the same fashion, that the events of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim were the prototype, the pre-enactment, the Masei Ovesim Lebanim, to the Gula HaAsida. And all of these mm-hmm. miracles will replay again before the coming of Mashiach. So whatever we're going to read about and learn, the night of the Seder, it's not history, it's destiny. It's mm-hmm. the future of the Jewish people. Mm-hmm. You know, the Nesivas has a diok, 
al achas kama kama toiva kefula umechupelas, where every right. single uh, miracle was layered. You know, why was it layered? Because it happened then, but that was like a dress rehearsal that it will happen again. So Lashana Habab Yushalayim are the perfect bookends of the Haggadah. They reflect the Mamish, the Toichen Ha'inyan, the, the true nature of what we're trying to speak about the night mm-hmm. of the Seder. It's important that, you know, a teenager, does, do they, like the, the, the buzzword is, do they connect with right. something that happened so long ago? It's important that they understand this is not about past, it's about future, it's about them, it's about what they're going to see, it's about what they need to hope for. Right, I was going to ask you on, uh, you're talking about the, the Seder being meaningful and people connecting to it. For many people, maybe it's not as inspiring as it should be, as much as there's a lot of nostalgia, like you said. It brings back memories of people's youth, but they're sitting out there saying, they feel like, hold on, we, we read these words before, we've done it before. What's your secret as a Rav and as, and as a Mashpia and as a Mechaber of a Haggadah to infuse all of our Siddharim with the vitality, with, uh, with the freshness? So that's right. not like saying over the same... Vart that you heard 14 times on what Vehi stands for, you know? Right, right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I think, I think this point is very ennobling for people. If, if we could realize, aside from the idea that we're supposed to imagine as if we were there in the past, I think it's worthwhile to try to develop the, the idea that this is what we're hoping for in the future. I mean, Rabbi Bachai says there will be makos. There will be makos on the the Umay Sa'ilam, mm-hmm. that there'll be a Kriyas Yamsuf. That, I mean, he says, you know, how in the, in the Torah gives different dates of how long Mitzrayim lasted for. Was it, was it two, 210? Was it 400? Was it 430? And basically, Klai Sol didn't know how to reconcile all the dates until the day we left. And then they realized, okay, 210 in Mitzrayim, 400 from the late of Yitzchak, 430 from the Brisbane Abbasarim. But at the time, you had, you know, Bnei Ephraim, they left 30 years early, they miscalculated. But Rabbi Mechai just points out, if you look in Sefer Daniel, three different dates are given. We don't even know what the years are. So he says, if when we knew precise numbers, 210, 400, 430, we still couldn't reconcile it until it happened, Alachas Kama Vakama, the three dates given in Daniel, will not be able to be reconciled until the great day comes. <laughs> mm-hmm. But he, he literally learns that every single detail will replay itself. To the point I saw, like, one, one of the Rebbes asked, the Shem Ramunim asks, well, you know, by, uh, by Makas Bechayrois, it says there will never be a scream like that. So that's, no, he says, because La'asad Lavai, it won't only be the Bechayrim. All the enemies. Uh-huh. So, to read the Haggadah like that, that this is, this is not just ancient history, it's what we're aspiring for, what we're yearning for, mm-hmm. changes the, the view on the Haggadah. Right. Now in this, in this Haggadah, there, you have any favorite uh, Vartlach? People always want to know, what's your favorite Vart? My favorite Vart. Favorite Vart. insight, something that people, okay. that may, or a revelation that maybe people don't know. Okay, this, this is a gift from heaven. <laughs> this is a gift from heaven. At the, the Haggadah begins with this famous Seder. Uh, you have Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Lazar Nazaria, Rabbi, Rabbi Tarfain, Rabbi Yeshua. They're, they're in Bnei Brak. You have five Tanoam Bnei Brak. It's one of the only accounts of Tanoam sitting at a Seder. And this, I always wondered, I mean, you have Rabbi Lazar Nazaria, you have Rabbi Akiva, you have Rabbi Yeshua. Where's the Nasi? Where's Ram Gamliel? Where'd he go? Well, he wasn't invited. You know, what's going on? So, I don't know, maybe he, he was out of town. He was with his own family. Mm-hmm. There is, by the way, a Toisefta that talks about Ram Gamliel Seder. And it says Ram Gamliel spent the whole night learning Hilchois Pesach, which is very different from what these Tanoam did. They were uh, Mesaprim, Yitzhiyas, Mitzrayim. Right. So where was he? Right. By the way, he's not mentioned in the whole Haggadah. Mm-hmm. Until the end. Until the end. Oh, the end. And, but but when, when he comes back, he comes back with a bang. Okay, so this was... If you look in the, in the Yad of the Rambam, the Rambam has there a Nusach of the Haggadah. He adds one word that revolutionizes the whole Haggadah. He says, we know there's also a Mishnah that we say, 
Amar Rebbe Lezim Nazaria, Hare Ani Keben Shevim Shana. Everybody knows, you know, I'm, as if I'm 70 years old, but really he was 18. It was the day he was appointed as Nasi. The Ramam adds the word Lohem. Amar Lohem Rebbe Lezim Nazaria, meaning at that historic seder of the five Tanoim, that's where he said it. He said to them, by the way, I feel like I'm 70. That means we know that was the day he was appointed the Nasi. But the day he was appointed a Nasi, Ram Gamliel was deposed. So that explains why he wasn't there. Obviously, he wasn't there. He was deposed. He probably wasn't comfortable sitting with the group of uh, Chacham that deposed him. Mm-hmm. The Gemara says that the day Ram Gamliel was deposed, the Beis Medrash was Nitoisva Hasafsalm. He had many, either 400 benches, 700 benches. Why? Because Ram Gamliel had a policy called Talmud She'ein Toichai Kabara Al Yikanes. You had to be worthy to enter the base Medrash. I think it is very telling that the Haggadah begins on the day Ram Gamliel is deposed. Because what are we doing the night of the Seder? Night of the Seder we're saying, let's open the doors, bring in all the Kinderlach, the Tam, the Sheni Yadeh the Rasha, everybody in. Do you think if Ram Gamliel was standing at the door, they'd all be able to come in? There's not a chance they'd be let. He would have let, it would be, Keneged Ben Echa Dibra Taira. Mm-hmm. Right. So the whole nature of the Seder is it doesn't matter who the child is, it's an open door policy. So the Haggadah has to begin. Amar Lohem Rebbe Lezben Azaria, and Ram Gamliel's not here. So he says, How does he get back in the door? I think the Haggadah parallels that story in the Gemara Brachais perfectly. Because at the end of the story, Ram Gamliel asks Rebbe Lezben Azariah, Rabbi Shua for Mechila. Right? The Gemara says it was precipitated because Ram Gamliel asked Rabbi Shua to stand and Rabbi Shua was very uncomfortable and the Chacham didn't like that Ram Gamliel was imposing his authority over Rabbi Shua. Ultimately, Ram Gamliel asked Rabbi Shua for Mechila. Rabbi Shua says no. Ram Gamliel says, do it in the honor of my Avoisai. Rabbi Nisim says, who was Ram Gamliel's forefathers? Hillel. Ah, so if we want to bring Ram Gamliel back into the Seder, we got to invoke Hillel. Zechel and Mikdosh Hillel. Kach, yeah? Mm-hmm. We, have to, we have to mention Hillel. Now, the Gemara says that, that there was a great dilemma when we bring Ram Gamliel back. Should we make Ram, Rav Lezer ben Azariah step down? We can't do that. Malin b'koydesh ve'in mo'iridin. Mm-hmm. Yeah? So the Gemara says, okay, we've got to keep Rav Lezer. Should they split the duties? The Gemara came up with the following formula. Three and one. Ram Gamliel gets three weeks. Rav Lezer ben Azariah gets one week. So when we bring Ram Gamliel back, we say, Ram Gamliel, you're back. We give you three things. But the Haggadah Mamish parallels that episode of Rav Lezim Rabbi Shua. And I found the Siyua in Rav Nachman of Breslov to this whole. He says, when they came to uh, tell the Chachamim, you know, Higia Zman Kriyashma, so the Likutim Maran says, Higia Kriyashma Shel Shachris. Shachris stands for Sheni Adia Lishol Chacham Rasha Tam. In other words, in other words, they were saying the reason why we're having this seder is to let Everyone's, everybody in. We need the wow. shachris. We need everybody in. Once we've let everyone in, perhaps we could bring Ram Gamliel back in as well. Wow! But that, that's just an example of how the format of the Haggadah, and I think that's like a, a novel uh, matana. <laughs> yeah. Wow! What an explanation, and what a find from Lukute Maran. <laughs> yeah. Um what else? What else do you have to share? Yeah, so let's talk about, also, you know, we know, you know, the Reikeach, Rebbe Lezer Gamarza, ascribes significance, let's say, to the number of words in Megillah Sester, or the number of right. words in each segment of Tefillah. So it's like, is there a significance, or do we even have a number count of the number of words in the Haggadah? I have a Sefer, it's a very rare Sefer, it's called Sefer Avas Taira, by Rav Pinchas Isharwitz, from, I believe, the 19th century. He says he did a count from the beginning of the Haggadah until the official end of Gal Yisrael. 1,820 words in the Haggadah. I say, okay, what are you going to do with that? He said he counted the number of times the Shem Havaya is in the Chumash. 1,820 20 times. Adkan, Adkan. But it hit me, it's so clear why the number of words in the Haggadah correspond perfectly to the number of times Shem Havai is in the Megillah. You see, ach, um, yeah. By the way, according to yeah. the Gears today, it's Amar Lohem. Yeah. 
I don't know what, what the count would be. The count would be off. Oh, <laughs> saying good. You're saying good. Very good. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> we could be By the way, off, is yeah. it uh, uh, curious, not to interrupt your train of thought, the text of the Haggadah as we know it, mm -hmm. across Klai Israel, is it pretty much uniform from community to community? Are you, are you familiar from you Ashkenazim to Svardim to... It's to a very good question. And I don't want to say definitively, because uh -huh. I'm not certain. Uh -huh. I'm not sure. But at least according to one gear, so it's 820 words, for it's sure. It's 1,820 oh, eight, words. 1,800 I guess Nusuch Ashkenazim, in, in other words, you know, the Nusuch of Ashkenazim. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I'm sure each Kehillah, whatever their word count is, there's a... Dvarim G'dayim Einem B'mikra. Right. But, right, right. So, so, you know, Paroi, was Paroi a Mamin or was Paroi a Koifer? So it's a big question. Right. Paro had a very good Rebbe, and his Rebbe was Yosef. And Paro tells Yosef the dream, and Yosef says, Paro, Eloi Kim Yane Shalom Paro. And when Yosef interprets the dream, Paro said, you're right, good gezok, Yosef. Hanimso koze ish asharuach Eloi Kim boy. So it sounds like he became a mammon. Right. On the other hand, throughout the, the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, Paro says, Mi Hashem asher eshma b'koylai. So was he a mammon or was he not? So the Shlach Kaddish says, Paroi was a mamin in Eloi Kim. He was a koifer in the Shem Havaya. What uh -huh. does that mean? He believed God created the world, but he, Oilam Kim in Hagainoyeg. He set it in a system, he turned on the conveyor belt, he pressed start, and now the world operates. Hateva, Eloi Kim is Hateva. He believed in, in nature. But he did not believe that Hashem was Hoya Hoya Viyet, Mahave Kol Havais, that Hashem could override the system that Hashem is mechadesh b'chol yom tam in masabrashis, and he constantly is changing and overriding, and every event that happens is the Yad Hashem at that mm -hmm. moment. Parah did not believe in that. So the purpose of the makos was to show that there's a yud kei vav mm -hmm. So it comes out very beautiful and very compelling that the number of words in the Haggadah correspond to the Shem Havaya. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose of the Haggadah. The tachlis of the Haggadah is to come to Hakara in the in the shame I, th I thought you were going to say that he believed in, in Elohim and Midas Hadin only. Oh. Not Shem Avayi to Midas Arachman. Yeah. That, uh, that and, the Rabbi Shom was going to take out his... It his could be the, the, the concept of Din and, and Teva is connected and the concept right. of Rachman and, and Shem Avayi is also connected. So it's, it, it's it could a, be that Hach, as well. Maybe. Yeah. Right. That he didn't believe that, that despite them falling to the... To the Memta Shari Tuma, that uh, there's the Midas oh. Rach, that's that. On that, that note, yeah. on the Memta Shari Tuma, right before the Haggadah went to print, I'll give a little insight. This is an inside yeah. art scroll? Yeah. Okay, I hope I can. Right. <laughs> right before the Haggadah went to print, I got a hold of the Haggadah of Chaim Falaji. I'm a big. Yeah, yeah uh, I know you're Talmud a big Rabbi 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 I even went to uh, his kever in Turkey when, uh, back, in the, back in, the, in the good old days when you could still go to Turkey. He wrote a Haggadah, Zechir L'chaim. So, so I'm looking at the Halach Ma'anya. It says, Piska Aleph. So I say, Piska B. I see, Ma'ashtana, Piska B. Piska Gimel, Piska. I say, how many Piskois are there? Go'al Yisrael, Piska Nun. And then it stops. So, so, and then I see that Rav Chaim Falaji says he broke, he wanted to break up the Haggadah into components to see how many segments there are. And he says, lo and behold, he discovered there are 50 segments in the Haggadah. And the reason is, based on Tikkun Zayar, and also Reb Eliyahu Akhoin of Izmir, it says Yitzhiyat Smitzrayim 50 times in the Chumash, because had we remained there a moment longer, we would have fallen into the Sharnun, the point of no return. So Yitzhiyat Smitzrayim was, was HaKadosh Baruch Hu being moitzias from the 50 Sha'arim, keneged zeh, they enacted, they, they formatted the Haggadah with 50 segments. Mm -hmm. So to me, Again, this all fits into what I was trying to accomplish with the Haggadah, that I, I, I want to see the Haggadah as a formatted, one formatted document. How many words are there? How many segments are there? What's the flow? Why do some people come in at different intervals? Mm -hmm. so, I want, so I put in the Haggadah, um, in the very beginning, a list of all the various uh, piskais. And what they are. Like I listed, I named all the uh, chapters of the Haggadah. Let's see if we could. And based on Reb Chaim Falaji. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here on page 131. The 50 Puskais. Mm -hmm. However, if 
for art scroll ever does a Reb Chaim Falaji Haggadah, okay. okay, this is the inside art scroll, <laughs> then it will say by each one what number it is. Uh-huh. But this is not the Reb Chaim Falaji Haggadah. Haggadah but... So just in one section, it lists uh-huh. the 50, uh, the 50 uh, Piskais. It's interesting, you mentioned the Mem Shari Tumah, but uh, Chazal also say that there, was, there, there will never be a door like the Yotzim Mitzrayim. So uh, on one hand, they had fallen to the lowest level of Tumah, on the other hand, there was something very unique about the Yoytzim, about that door that will never be replicated. Mm-hmm. H- how does that dichotomy work? Okay, that's a very important question. And, and this is really a question that should be focused on and addressed more. And there's an essay on this question in, in this Haggadah. I will point out, when we talk about the Mem Shari Tuma, and this idea that if we were to fall into the Shar Nun, it's the point of no return. Right. I want to point out, it's so common, we always say it, the, the shar nun, the point of no return. Is there a shar nun? It's very, um, many maintain that indeed there is a shar nun. The Vilna Goyen says, nivra, there is no shar nun. It does not exist. The Gran Mishle says on the Pasuk, Kol payal Hashem l'ma'anehu v'gam rasha liyoyim ra. Koyal, the shar nun of Kedusha, payal Hashem l'ma'anehu. Vigam, 49, Russia. There are only 49 for the Russia. There is no mm-hmm. Sharnon. The Leshem brings that there is an opinion in Kabbalah there is a Sharnon. And the Leshem says the Gra is definitively correct. There is no Sharnon. Oh, wow. So that's a very interesting. Mm-hmm. But, but there is, let's say, even according to the Leshem and the Gra, there's a Shar Mem test, the point of no return. And if I could just interrupt very briefly, I always wondered how could you say there's a point of no return? I mean, isn't that antithetical? Don't to we the always whole believe? Of Yiddish, no, you said, Ad yoy moisai. Ad yoy moisai. Right. Ein yosh ba'olam. Right. Hashem, b'chol yoy mechak alai. Hashem, Hashem is always, uh, even acher, the Chazal say, shuvu vanum shoivavim chutz me acher, but, kalma sh'amra l'cha balabayis asei, chutz me tzei. The Shlach says, whatever Rebun Shem tells you, you listen, Unless he says, get out, you can't do tshuva. Then you don't have to uh, listen. Right. Anyone could do tshuva. I was thinking about this. I was thinking about this. What exactly is this point of no return? And, you know, the point of no return is a Kabbalistic concept. And I think I found the answer in the most basic source, the Rambam. You know, the Rambam in Hilchus Avodah Zarah writes about the development of Avodah Zarah. The Rambam says, you know, that uh, Avram Avinu came along and he planted in the hearts of Kal Yisrael the Iker of Emunah and he gave it over to Yitzchak and he gave it over to Yaakov and then we went down to Mitzrayim and the planting of Avraham began to wane, yeah, wane, wane, wane and had we remained a moment longer the planting that Avram planted in us would have been Ne'ekar Legamri and to me, it sounds very similar to this idea of the point of no return, but it's giving a rationale. And I think it's as follows. There is no question that there is no point of no return. You could always do tshuva. You could always do tshuva. But here's the thing. Who are we? Who is Rabbi Yitzchak Hizagar? Who's Daniel Gladstein? We are B'nai Avraham. Why are we B'nai Avraham? Because there's something that Avraham planted into our spiritual DNA. However... Had we remained in Mitzrayim a moment longer, you know who we would have been? We just would have been us. And we could not trace back our spiritual ancestry to Avram Avinu. We would have been cut off from the Avais HaKadoshim. Not that we would have, been, um, not that we would have fallen into the abyss and we can never return to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but the connection to the, the bedrock of our, of our past would have been completely severed. So Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim then is a celebration. Not, oh, Hashem took us out of the Shar Nun. What is the Shar Nun? Hashem rescued us so that we were able to recover our eternal connection to the Avais. Maybe that's why we have the emphasis of the Higada to Labincha. There's no other mitzvah that you have to give to your child. Do the mitzvah. Shake the lulav. Blow the shofar. But Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim was a celebration that we're eternally connected. That's perhaps the, the, the meaning behind this point of no return. But you ask, you know, so how do we evaluate the level that Kalah Yisrael were on uh, when they left Mitzrayim? Were they on the brink or were they on the highest level? Right. 
The Leshem says that it's a mistake to say that the night of Yitzhiya Mitzrayim we were going to fall to the brink. How could that be, he says. Once Hashem began to bring the Makos, like a year earlier, and we began to see the Hashkacha, that propelled us to great heights. Mm-hmm. If, the, if we were ever on the brink, it, it was, was prior to the Before the Makos. The, Makos. Uh-huh. the night of Yitzhiya Mitzrayim, like you said before, we were on the highest level of anyone mm. in history. Ready for this? Uh-huh. I want everyone, all the audience, to fasten their seatbelts. Says the Baal HaLashem, you know what it means had we remained in Mitzrayim a moment longer? We would have been on the point of no return. Had we remained in Mitzrayim a moment longer, with such giloy shechina, we would have been propelled to the 50th level of Kedusha, uh-huh. and then there would be no tachlis habria, and then we would have to call it a day. Oh. So not that we would fall to the point of no return, we would have been propelled Lamala to the, um, of a madriga that Hashem wanted us to be on. So, at first we were at the brink. Through the Makos, Hashem began to elevate us until the night of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. We were at the brink of the summit of Kedusha. Had we remained there a moment longer, we would have been elevated to the greatest level and mm. that we couldn't have yet. I would add that the amazing... A component of this vart that you're saying is that they were able to reach the pinnacle of Kedusha still in Mitzrayim. They were still in the Ervas Aret. It was in Mitzrayim itself, which was the most immoral land in the world, where they fell to the, lo- to the lowest abyss. But also it was within that environment that they also rose to the highest level of Kedusha, which should provide tremendous chizuk to everyone. Now, Beautiful. that even within the immoral environment, a person could reach that level of holiness and purity. Beautiful. Sometimes people think, oh, I have to be extracted, extricate me from the Ervas Aret, and then I'll be able to reach the Kedusha. This part that you're saying is, is, is so potent and so powerful because it's telling us that Adra, but Klaitro reached that level even when they were there, before they went out. Beautiful. Mar-y-dik. Beautiful. Beautiful. Ah. Beautiful. Mamusha, Thank we have you. a Rizcha Dei Yeah, here. what could be better? <laughs> That's what the... the, the, the uh, when you're embarking on a voyage of Kedusha, you know, you always have to remember, don't be down on yourself. Uh-huh. Because think about where they were and still what they were able to elevate themselves to. Speaking of elevating, this Haggadah is, uh, is, is pure spiritual bliss. It's an elevation. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I know how much, how, much, how much Aliyah I felt going through the beautiful shtiklach and, and those who didn't go through it last year and even those who did should make sure to do it again, get a hold of that God I think it will enhance their seder quite significantly Thank and, you. and uh, it's never too late to, to wish you a mazel tov on the release. Thank you. Release. Thank you very much. Thank it's a year you. old but it's as fresh <laughs> and it's as new as ever and there's so much in here and uh, we, we appreciate you sharing from your wellsprings of Yedias and, and your passion and your messages that resonate with people uh, so beautifully. So, Chal Chal Raisa, keep, mm. keep, uh, keep doing what you're doing with Thank your you. Abba Tzatayra and putting out such really beautiful svarim, such a Kiddush Shem Shemayim. Thank you very much. And thank you for being here. My pleasure, and it's a great honor to see you. <laughs> thank you.